Okay. So we got it so that we got plenty of time. And I'll just I'll just call them out order. Where'd Deli go? She's back there talking to Carl Holloway. Oh, that's see. Uh, Good. Hopefully, Justin will. Good. All right. If you want to, if you want to give Deb the signal, we'll go ahead and I'll just call no order. I don't see. We never met. I'm Gary Stein from the class of '56, but my friend Russ Robinson told me to come Yes. Yes. He's a good guy. Joe's a bloker. Good to meet you. How are you? Yeah. He and. Uh, Laddie and that, that crew were very close. Yeah, oh, we were. It was yeah. a wonderful group. We had about 38, 40 in the class, and Russ and I stayed very close over the years. Yeah. I hope so. Yep. All right, everybody, welcome. <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see so many folks here on such a beautiful afternoon. Um, I've met some of you, but I don't know all of you, so let me introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Joseph Bloker. Uh, I teach primarily constitutional law and property here at the law school. I also teach classes on capital punishment, law and markets. I taught a seminar on um, law and the history of Durham. Um, and as a Durham native, that was a, that was a fascinating class for me to teach. Um, uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, and it's a, a really special honor, I think, to see all of you here. I assume that many of you have had a chance to be welcomed by your classmates, maybe by the dean. Um, but if you haven't seen your old professors yet, um, let me say on behalf of all of us, I see some former students, although not, um, not, not all of you have I had the pleasure of teaching, um, uh, we, it's lovely for us that, to see you here. It just means so much to see the institution, uh, see the people who built the institution and made it as wonderful as it is. Um, I have the very, very special honor today of leading a conversation, a discussion with um, uh, Eric Mishaw from the class of 1966. Um, known to many of you, um, one of our distinguished graduates who's lived a life um, in and out of the law that has sort of um, coincided with some major and important changes at Duke and Durham uh, and the country as a whole. Um, and before I start um, talking to Eric, let me welcome his family. Um, uh, we're, we're fortunate to be joined today um, by, by Eric's wife, Della, his son, Justin, um, uh, and his brother, uh, Mickey, and his wife, June, um, may be known to many of you. Senator Mishaw has represented me for, I think, all but two of my life, uh, two years of my life uh, in, the, uh, in the North Carolina legislature. So thank you for being here, too. Um, let me start by asking uh, this question, actually, Eric, um, because it, it springs from conversations that I just overheard you having with some of your oh classmates and, uh, <laughs> and things that have come up when I, even when I talk to students who've only been out five or 10 years. I've only been here since 2009, um, so I, you know, my, my students haven't been gone that long. But even in that space, when they come back, they say, Durham has changed so much, uh, even in the last five or 10 years. So, so I wonder if maybe we could start just, you know, you've got an interesting perspective on that as someone who's raised here, went to Duke, spent most of your adult life here. Um, if you could just tell us sort of what life was like growing up here then, your father's business, um, what Durham was like uh, when you were a child. Well, there were two communities when I grew up. It was a white community and a black community. 
And basically, uh, the black, black community survived because they were industrious, had their own sources of financing uh, through many of the financial institutions, and they got the reputation of being the uh, black Wall Street. And uh, because I think there were at least eight financial institutions here, uh, including uh, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, which uh, became the largest minority-owned business for a number of years, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, Mutual Community Savings Bank. Uh, so, you know, the microeconomics, the dollar that stays in the community, I learned somewhere in some economics course uh, that, that the dollar multiplied itself. And uh, that was a true example of uh, microeconomics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we had uh, our own uh, restaurant, and we, we did have a furniture store uh, in our community. We had theaters, and uh, there were several places, even one hotel, not uh, a five-star hotel, but it was a hotel, and many other businesses that survived. You, uh, you, you've told me before some, some interesting stories about how it really sort of became clear to you, the, these, these lines about segregation when you were young. And one of the stories that you, you mentioned, or an incident you mentioned, which I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing, is, uh, involves a theater, a theater boycott um, when, you were, when you were young. This was, it seemed like sort of a galvanizing moment for you. Well, uh, the, the theory of boycott came out if we boycotted many of these businesses that they would soon have to integrate, the bus boycotts and things of that nature. Uh, and I was in the habit of going to the movie theaters. Uh, the Center Theater, the Carolina Theater were two primary theaters in Durham. But as a black, you had to walk up a mile of stairs in order to get to your seat. So, and that was the way they segregated, according to the law at that time, uh, the black community from the white community. And uh, my parents asked me at one point, uh, how many times are you going to vote for segregation? I said, what are you talking about? They said, every time you pay for that ticket, it is a vote for segregation. And I said to them, because I was a young, fledgling youngster, 12, 13 years of age, where the hormones were just hitting, I said, you, you, you don't really understand. He said, that, <laughs> that, that's where we socialize. That's where we kind of meet the young ladies without supervision. <laughs> and uh, I said, you want me to stop doing that? And that's the only reason that you're asking me to do this. Uh, on the way back home from the Center Theater once, uh, and some of you in here, I see Wade is here. I don't know how many other former Durhamites are here. There used to be uh, a bus stop in front of Jones and Frazier on Main Street, and that's where we caught the bus to go back to the black community. And I was standing there waiting for the bus, and this young lady was blonde, blue-eyed, she obviously was white, came skipping along in front of me, much younger than I was. And I took an assessment of her condition, which was she was very happy, free, and carefree. And I couldn't be that way on Main Street. And then it dawned on me that that's, that's a, a catalyst, that is a a, an earmark for segregation, that I was limited and she wasn't, even though I was older. It was then that I decided that I would boycott and join the rest of my colleagues and friends in not going to the movie theaters. The next theater I saw the inside of was in Boston, when I went to school in Boston, uh, and I was a sophomore at that time, so that's a number of years of just absolutely not going to a movie theater. And uh, you got kind of used to it, and somebody said, didn't you see this such and such a movie? I said, no, I didn't miss it at all. Because it was the principle of being segregated 
that I was protesting at that point. The story of how you got to Boston or the, the people who encouraged you along the way is also worth telling. There's, there's at least one figure in that, that story that I think will be familiar to everybody about how you sort of went to be, ended up going to, to, to Boston University. Uh, that was uh, interesting, and I'll, I'll never, it's one of those things that you never forget. Uh, during the time I was considering going to universities uh, and making application, uh, we had a very outstanding visitor come to our home to stay. It was Dr. Martin Luther King. He was not allowed to stay in any of the hotels in town at that time because of segregation. So our family, and uh, Mickey brought him to Durham for a speech uh, to the Durham Business and Professional Association. Uh, and this is pre-Nobel uh, Peace Prize for Dr. King. But he came and uh, he stayed in our home because uh, we opened our home up to many visitors who could not stay in the hotels. Uh, and my parents informed him that I was making application to go to college. Uh, and he said, uh, have you thought about Boston University? And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's, you know, that's sort of up north, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> He said, uh, yeah, he said, but I think that uh, I can get you in. And he and Dr. Alan Knight Chalmers, who some of you may recognize that name, was treasurer of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And Chalmers was a uh, professor of theology at Boston University and a well-renowned person in uh, the United States. So. Uh, they both uh, signed my application to uh, Boston University, and the rest is history. <laughs> so. well, it's, uh, it's while you're at, at Boston University, though, you start making, this is a look into the future, not the history, you start making some choices about what you want to do with your career, and sort of with your job, which becomes very relevant after your time at the law school, and if you could say, while you're at BU, the, the commitments you make about what you want to do, and particularly what you were just talking about some classmates here with regard to the military. Well, uh, I, at Boston U, I decided that I would take business and some other courses to help learn <coughs> the business world and accounting and those kinds of things in order to assist our father in the business, real estate, real estate management, sale of insurance uh, here in Durham and wherever else we could. And, uh, and that was my goal in undergraduate school. Uh, I did not decide to go to law school until maybe my junior or senior year because I saw a nexus between that and business. Uh, and I said, if I take law, that will assist in business and assist my dad, and we can uh, go from there. And uh, I decided to apply to law school and I didn't want to apply to a whole lot of law schools because I never wanted to practice law. It was going to be an adjunct to my other education. And so I applied to North Carolina Central University and was accepted. And from there, the story of how you ended up at Duke Law School is also an interesting. The, the, the admissions process is a lot different for those of you I see who are more recent students than <laughs> it used to be. But your story, may it involves some names that may be familiar to people who, who went through this decades ago. So I wonder if you could tell the, about the catalog and Ms. Bird. And... Oh, well, all, all my classmates would recognize the, the names uh, in relationship to Duke. But I also was an ROTC student at Boston University, which meant that I had a military commitment immediately upon graduation. But I got a what is called a Category C educational delay to go to law school. And while in law school, I felt that this educational delay would allow me one opportunity to take the bar exam and one opportunity to pass it. Now, 
Duke had no failures on the North Carolina bar exam. Other schools had failures. So I said, let me ensure my chance. <laughs> <laughs> and I came to Duke one day when I was working for my father in an old t-shirt and khaki pants, really rustic, <laughs> uh, looking for catalog to see maybe what I could take in terms of courses and that type of thing. And this was between my fresh, my one, they call them 1Ls now, mm -hmm. 1Ls and 2L uh, law school career. And I was standing in the lobby right outside that wall there, uh, looking at the materials. And a lady walked up, and she introduced herself as Mrs. Bird. And I said, nice to meet you. And uh, she said, do you want to talk to the dean? Those were the first words out of her mouth. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't want to talk to the dean. <laughs> she said, uh, because I'm here just to get materials. And, and, and I, I want to go back and study them and look at them. She said, well, the dean might want to talk to you. And I said, that's nice. Uh, and she said, why don't you wait here just a second, and I'll see if I can go get him. And I said, this is embarrassing. I'm not dressed to do any kind of interview. I'm, I'm, I don't even know whether I smell or not, but, uh, because I was working. And uh, pretty soon, this short fellow comes out. And he walks up and he says, I, I hear you're interested in coming to Duke Law. I said, who told you that? <laughs> I said, I never mentioned Duke Law to Ms. Bird or anything else. He said, I said, I don't know whether I want to come to Duke Law or not. He said, well, why don't you come on into my office and let's talk about it. Well, I ended up in the dean's office and we talked about a little about my history and about where I was from and Durham and those kinds of things. And he said, after about 45 minutes or so, he said, well, why don't you go around and talk to some of the professors who are on the admissions committee and see whether or not uh, you can come to do. And I said, admissions committee? I said, I'm in khaki pants. Said, Fine, let's go. <laughs> so I, I, uh, Jack Johnson, who was here then, was one of the persons I remember talking to. And there were two others who asked me where I wanted to practice law. Now remember, I didn't want to practice law. <laughs> but I had to have an answer because it was more of a challenge to me at that point. They said, where do you want to practice law? And I said, North Carolina. They said, well, why don't you apply to the University of North Carolina? Because if you're going to practice in North Carolina, there'll be more Carolina graduates practicing law than there will be Duke in North Carolina. Well, that produced a challenge. Why are you trying to get me to go to Carolina? <laughs> that was my attitude then, because I really didn't have to have a positive attitude about <clears throat> changing law schools. I was in the top of my class at Central, and I was having a great time of one of six students in my class. And uh, it, it was great. It was great. I got all the books in my freshman year. And uh, Do they still award books for top grades now? Book prize. We yeah. don't call it that. But there's some version of it. Some version of it. OK. Well, anyway, uh, and I said, that sounds like a whole lot more work than I'm presently doing. But uh, I said, you know, Carolina might not want me. And at that time, there was a distinct possibility that they may not want me. And I said, and I may not like Carolina. So they ended the, those interviews. And we went back to Dean Laddie's office. And he said, well, I want you to know that the class is full. And we've got the third highest cutoff score in the nation, short of Harvard, Yale, and one other school. And I said, that's nice. <laughs> uh, and I went back. And he said, here's an application, by the way. And I took the application and went home. And I, I mean, this was a real pull now. Uh, and I said, I wrote back, 
with the application a letter saying, please accept this application as a second year, second semester student only. The dean wrote back, said, uh, you know, transferring in the middle of a law school career is difficult in and of itself. But transferring in the middle of a year is even more difficult. And when I read this letter, I said, that's it. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I'm still at Central. Uh, a month later, and the reason I, I made the commitment to come back to Central was the fight for the moot court team that I got on as a freshman. And I wasn't supposed to be on it until the second year, but I made a credible argument, as most lawyers do, that uh, if I got the first year experience, I could be even be more experienced as a 2L student. So uh, I got this letter from uh, Dean Ladd, please come out to Duke for your uh, final interview. And I said, no, I've been interviewed twice, and many interviews, but <laughs> I said, why am I going out for another final interview? Anyway, I showed up. And went to the dean's office. This time I had time coat on. And he uh, said, uh, Eric, we understand that uh, you're involved in your father's business and you work in the afternoons when you finish law school and you go there and you're involved in the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People and we're involved in this activity and that activity. And we, we just want to know whether you're going to become a serious student of law or not. In other words, are you going to give up all these extracurricular activities and devote yourself to the study of law? And I looked at him and I said, well, Dean, let me explain it to you this way. That's my father's business, and I hope to go into it when I graduate. So any opportunity I have to learn that business and be a part of it, I'm not going to give up. And I said, as far as becoming a serious student of the law or not, I said, I can't promise you that either. And I said, because your idea of what a serious student of the law is and my idea, two different things, maybe two different things. And I don't want to make a commitment to you that I don't know what your standard is. I don't want to breach that contract before we get started. And so I can't promise that to you either. At which point, he called Mrs. Bird in. He said, Ms. Bird, please take this letter. Dear Eric, we are happy to admit you to Duke Law School. And that's how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was pick up the story after that then, because, um, <laughs> because I wonder if you could say a little bit about what the experience was like uh, after you arrived. You've made this transfer. You've come in as a transfer student, um, and you've come in as the one black student in your class, and at a time when, for those who are not familiar with the history here, Duke University had just begun admitting black students, I think 1963, the Allen Building takeover, the first one is 1969, coming, um, coming up quickly after your graduation. It's a sort of, the, the, I imagine that the, 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 the issue is just impossible to avoid. Um, what was the experience like? Well, it wasn't that difficult for me in dealing with majority students. At Boston University, we got uh, great exposure to all kinds of students. I think they had, they, they had 35,000 students or so at Boston University all over the city. So uh, that wasn't uh, as strange as when I finished class uh, at Central, uh, you'd go to the library and you'd hang out with the other four classmates that were there, and uh, you talk about the weekend and weekend activities. Uh, whereas I went looking for my classmates here at Duke, and 80% of this class was married. So they weren't there. I'd go down to, there was a commons area, used to be, where students gathered at lunch or shortly thereafter. And no one was there. They had all gone home. And I couldn't figure that out. I couldn't figure out where they were hanging out until I found out that the majority were married. And I said, oh, this is 
not quite the social life that I had envisioned <laughs> in law school. But, uh, but that's the way it was. It was different. And uh, I didn't get to know a lot of the students uh, on a personal basis uh, for two reasons. One, I was a latecomer to the law school. And uh, they had already formed their social cliques and, 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 and weekend entertainment. And that thing went on for years. So uh, I had to do the best I could. So we got a chance to catch up on it a little bit this weekend, which is nice. Right? <laughs> it's socialized oh yeah, the it was, it was, it's been a great weekend seeing uh, these people I haven't seen in uh, a few years. So 25 years ago at the first reunion uh, that I came to, and I couldn't realize, couldn't believe that this was another 25 years. It's uh, it's amazing to see some of them, and uh, some of them have grown facial hairs and. <laughs> Other things to help support themselves, I guess. <laughs> you mentioned in, that in your conversations with the dean, there was a discussion about practicing law in North Carolina, which obviously was not the number one priority for you in graduation. And we'll talk about what you do end up doing. But you did, it seems like, have a sense of what the community of black lawyers in Durham at the time was like. And some the meetings on Parrish Street and maybe some involvement with the Everett family. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit about that, because that's a story most people, I think, don't know. Well, those are two different stories. Um, and, and some of it does cross over. Uh, one of which uh, everyone who's been through Duke would know Robbie Everett. Uh, Robbie Everett's father and mother were both practicing attorneys here in Durham. Uh, there was a rape case being tried, and I believe it was in Henderson, by some elder lawyers, black lawyers in Durham were, were the lawyers defending the case. And uh, the, as they tried the case, the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, was marching around the courthouse to influence the trial and more so to intimidate the black lawyers who were there. Uh, I was told, I wasn't around then, but, the, but Robinson Everett's father went to Henderson to pick up these lawyers to bring them back to Durham one evening. And uh, they came out through the basement of the courthouse and got into uh, Mr. Everett's car, and they were shot at as they drove away from, from Henderson. Uh, and out of curiosity, uh, I asked Rob, I said, had, you, had he ever heard that story? And, it, and he went off. He said, yes, you know. <laughs> and he lit up like a light bulb. He said he went home and he talked to mom, and she, she said she got a call. She didn't know where he, Mr. Everett was, but he wasn't home. And she got a call and said uh, that he had gone to Henderson to, to uh, collect these lawyers and bring them back to Durham. Uh, so uh, that was one interesting aspect of some of that history of Durham that uh, black lawyers weren't really always appreciated uh, in the community, communities around here. And when we started talking about CLE, which was the other half of that story, um, there used to be meetings, Saturday morning meetings, in the law offices of primary to Pearson Malone, Johnson, and DeJarman. DeJarman was the dean of the law school. I remember that Samson would often go up there. He was a professor of torts at Central. And when they would have cases, they would discuss these cases and, and do their research right in the offices on Saturday morning. And with the uh, advantage of having the dean of the law school and at least two or three professors of the law school, continuing education was almost every Saturday uh, because they could discuss these, these points of view. And uh, that's how they got their CLA. No requirements about the state bar, <laughs> uh, as we have it today. But uh. well, let's pick up on the bar. Then you mentioned that we sort of we, we sort of left a cliffhanger earlier. We said you only have one shot at the bar. Got to pass it. 
and I don't want to ruin the story, but you do pass, so no problem there. And I think you, maybe you and Mickey, even the same time, if I remember right, both passed the bar. Uh, that year, so, only two of us passed the bar. Okay. Only two blacks passed the bar in 1966. Uh, my brother and, and I were the only two that passed out of hundreds who, 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 who took the bar that year. So you all sail through on the test, um, and there's a little... I don't know about sailing yeah, through. Said, absolutely. It's a matter of historical we record it, yeah. uh, that I teach my students. But then, um, but then run into an obstacle with the NCBA, and I wonder if you could, you could talk, about, talk about that. NCBA, as I've learned it now, is North Carolina Bar Association. Um, the North Carolina Bar Association is primarily responsible, and I'm sure that all of you are aware of the integrated bar versus the mandatory bar. Mandatory bar versus in the two. Yeah. Uh, and the bar association, the volunteer bar. Vol North Carolina Bar Association was the volunteer bar, and North Carolina State Bar is the mandatory bar. Now, uh, I remember the conversation of being admitted uh, during the admission process of getting to know North Carolina lawyers. And North Carolina Bar Association is a, was a social and educational arm of the, the bar, not the enforcement side. So if you wanted to know the judges, the lawyers, and the, what's new in the bar, you go to the Bar Association meetings. So, and the other thing that the North Carolina Bar Association did was they gave the uh, practical skills course for the lawyers who had just gotten out of law school and did not know how to walk into a courtroom or the courthouse or even find out where the courthouse was. So I, I decided that I would take that course. Uh, and there was only one black sitting in the audience of that course that they taught in moi. Uh, at the end of it, or towards the end, they began passing out applications for membership in the North Carolina Bar Association. I was skipped in that process. And a fellow Duke law student out of my class came up and said, why didn't you get an application? I said, an application of what? He said, the North Carolina Bar Association. I said, well, that's what they were passing out. And he said, yes. So I said, I'll go back and ask if Bill Story was the executive secretary at that time. I went back and I asked him, I said, why didn't I get an application for the North Carolina Bar Association? And he looked at me and he said, well, we didn't want to embarrass you. I said, well, embarrassment is kind of a personal thing, isn't it? I said, uh, can I make that determination? And and he was very flustered. He sort of turned red in the face. But nevertheless, he gave me an application. Uh, and I said, no, give me two. Uh, one for me and one for my brother. Now, we filled out the application, got the records, signatures, and submitted them. Uh, we were invited interview sessions always get me. <laughs> Come over for an interview for membership in the North Carolina Bar Association. I had known of no attorney who had ever been interviewed for a membership in the North Carolina Bar Association. So we went over, and they had the whole board of governors seated in a room. And uh, if you all, those who are local, Remember B.B. Olive, who was a patent lawyer here in Durham, was in that meeting. So we got almost a blow by blow description from B.B. and uh, several other people. But uh, I made the statement that as lawyers, we are almost like the pediatrician is to a child, we are to the community. Not often do we understand what the community, or the community doesn't really express their problems or issues. You have to 
sort of ferret them out and, and decide what is the best course for human beings. And, and, and I assume that that was a role for lawyers over the years, and they've done this over the years, because they deal with so many people in so many communities. Anyway, uh, that was my speech, and I said, we all have to get together in order to understand this, and therefore make it a better world and a better place for everybody to live. So I got my letter of rejection uh, from the Bar Association. And uh, remember now, I just finished the exam, and I'm on my way to the Air Force to uh, fulfill my military commitment. Duke University Law School got wind of the rejection. And the next thing I knew on my way to Denver was that Duke University Law School had withdrawn their affiliation with the North Carolina Bar Association with the statement that if you can't accept one of ours, we don't need to be a part of you. Uh, it was a real revelation to me and a very appreciative revelation uh, that I had because our faculty and our school took this position. And, and uh, uh, it, it got broadcast all over the news and everything else. And, uh, uh, but I couldn't stay because of the military commitment and had to leave. Now, uh, Hodge O'Neill, F. Forrest Hodge O'Neill, who was the succeeding dean, uh, called me in my office, Air Force office in, in Denver, uh, a little later, and he said, uh, they really said some ugly things about you over that meeting. They uh, compared you to a communist. And this is the Bar Association. <laughs> it compared, because of my remarks, I was compared to being a communist. And I said, uh, and the dean said he had listened to the tape of that meeting. I said, well, did I sound like comedy? He said, no, no. <laughs> he said, nothing, nothing near that. He said, now, I've, I've got a situation that I've got to deal with. I said, well, what's that? He said, uh, they've invited us back for membership in the association, and they're going to drop the... Uh, the, the bars of segregation. And I said, great, that's wonderful. He said, but you will not be admitted as the first minority, the first black. You won't be admitted. I said, well, what's the deal? He said, they're going to admit Julius Chambers from the North Carolina Law School first. And you and your brother will be second, third, or wherever, but you won't be the first. So I'm sitting in Denver, and he's here, and I said, fine. I said, we've accomplished the goal, and, and the more, most important goal, which is bringing people together. And that was the intent of our application to begin with. So whatever the faculty decides on that, then I'll go along with that. So that's the story of the integration of the North Carolina Bar Association. You mentioned that by the time you, get the, you got the call from Hodge O'Neill, you were already out in Colorado on your way off to Vietnam. And I, I want to make sure we have some time to talk about your experience in JAG, because this is where it all sort of comes full circle, the commitments you've started to make at BU. And, and now here you are, um, uh, a young JAG lawyer in Vietnam, one of very, very few black JAG lawyers in the, the Air Force. Only the only in one in that theater. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk about the experience generally, and um, it, mm -hmm. particularly how it was being the one um, uh, black JAG lawyer in, the, in that theater. Uh, we had a very small office in Denver, there were four JAGs in there. And we dealt with administrative <coughs> discharges, very simple matters. Uh, and uh, Lowry Air Force Base was across on the other side of Denver from the Air Reserve Personnel Center where I was assigned. 
the wife of the NCOIC, when I said that, I think I lost a few people. The, the, chief, <laughs> the chief enlisted officer in the legal department's wife had been assaulted by an airman. Now, that involved, of course, not only the legal office, but base command and all those kind of influences that uh, could impact a trial because a court martial is selected from the offices on base and all that kind of good stuff. So the, someone decided, and I think it was the United States Air Force headquarters, decided that we'll go across town and get a lawyer to represent the defendant in a general court martial because the charge was assault with intent to commit rape and let him defend that uh, uh, enlisted man. Uh, and I enlisted the aid. I said, well, if I'm going to try it, I, I need the aid of another JAG. And they said, well, you can get one in your office. All of us were newly christened lawyers. Uh, and I got a gentleman out of North Dakota, Bob Hovey. I never will forget Bob. But we were assigned to defend this case. And right away, I assumed that there was a reason for that assignment. We were green. And they wanted retribution or whatever. So we started trying this case. And I've never seen, we confronted full, what I call full bull nurses, full colonel nurses. <laughs> in the hospital, never seen a full colonel nurse walk the uh, hospital floor. But we, were, we wanted to interview the victim. And uh, the day that they set up for the interview, she had an operation that day, and we couldn't interview. Uh, we developed a, a defense, uh, alcoholic amnesia. We were able to get psychiatrists. I mean, it was just, it was just an interesting trial. And uh, finally, when it came to a hearing, uh, the family uh, hired private counsel because military counsel was, had to be tainted. They, 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 there was no way that a uh, military JAG could defend uh, this person. But we assisted as much as we could uh, the civilian lawyer who came in who knew nothing about military justice. And uh, that's the way the trial went. And the individual did get uh, convicted. But the, the, the process uh, and in trying cases got me bit on wanting to try cases and wanting to practice law. So it was the Air Force experience that rerouted me <laughs> in the desire to practice law because I could see helping people and defending people uh, with the skills and the knowledge that I gained in law school. I have so many more questions about it, and I want to keep talking about Vietnam, but I also wanted to leave some time for questions from the audience or reflections or um, responses. Some of you know some of the characters have already appeared in Eric's story. If there are questions, otherwise I'm happy to keep talking about the Board of Law. Anybody have a question? Fox. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm one of those that grew up here. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. Then. <laughs> Would you just uh, uh, talk on a little bit about the uh, about the influence and the effectiveness of Robinson Everett in helping Duke lawyers become good military lawyers? Robinson was in his last round in the Air Force was chief judge of the Military Court of Appeals. I remember that. He also, when he was a full bird colonel, I met him at an Air Force function in San Antonio. Uh, the, the base near San Antonio. And I was surprised to see him.
But he always had an interest in military law. And I didn't, I didn't recognize this in law school. But if you were a Duke grad and in the Air Force, Robinson seemed some way or another to be able to find you uh, and, and, and talk about the great service that you were rendering to your country and the things that JAG was doing. And he really welcomed you uh, into that department. I, I appreciated uh, Robbie from that perspective. And uh, uh, we, we had something in common. And uh, I, I liked him. Is that? Well, did that continue on when you came back into uh, the civilian world, if you will? Well, of course, Robinson was here, and uh, we, we got to talk on many occasions about the practice of law. And uh, I remember at one bar meeting, uh, Robbie was uh, praising the fact that there had been three lawyers in succession, including Jim Maxwell, in that succession of Duke lawyers who had become president of the North Carolina Bar Association. There were three in a row, bang, 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 just like that. And he was, he was quite, quite proud of that fact because they, they held up the, the banner of Duke, Duke Law. So uh, not only did he have that relationship with me, but he had it with many other lawyers uh, who are here. You're, it, after the return to civilian life, one of the things you ended up doing is working for the Board of Law Examiners, which is a good story in and of itself. I wonder if you can talk <laughs> about whether, how that came about. And, you know, sometimes you can be at the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time. And uh, many of you, Jim would know, E.K. Poe, uh, cornered me one day and he said, uh, don't you want to be on the uh, Board of Law Examiners? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that sounds like a whole lot of work. <laughs> and he said, well... They may need you on that board. And I said, good. They may need me, but I don't know that I need that at this point in my life. But he, he uh, in EK's own way, uh, put my name up for membership on the North Carolina Board of Law Examiners. And... You know, Duke has a, has a reputation, and I'm glad of it. But uh, one against 12 was not such a bad deal. So I equalized things out because there were no other Duke lawyers on that board. But uh, I said, one to 12? Eh, that's, that's all right. We, we can handle that. Now, uh, my first day, in the first meeting of the Board of Law Examiners, uh, Jim Swales from Wilmington was chairman at that point. And uh, I remember uh, Bob Howison asking for the floor to make a speech. And with me, I don't have any problem. But his speech was directed at me in the sense that if I came on that board to get information to file a lawsuit against the board of law examiners in the state of North Carolina for any reason, as he put it. Uh, and he went on and on and on. And he must have gone on for a tirade of uh, at least 30, 30 minutes. And I looked out the window. We were meeting in the Supreme Court uh, chambers, in, uh, Supreme Court of North Carolina chambers. And I looked out. The one and I said, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, anyway, the, the board took a break. And as I was looking out of the window, a gentleman from the mountains of North Carolina came up and put his hand on my shoulder. And if you had ever wanted to describe a real redneck, <laughs> This guy looked exactly like one. And he was old and craggy and, 
And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Eric, I just want you to know one thing. I said, here we go. <laughs> he said, you are just as much a member of this board as anybody sitting in this room. And I don't want you to forget that. And I looked at his, his blue eyes. It was Bill McElwee. I don't know how many of you know Bill. But a genuine, genuine person and a genuine, genuine friend. And uh, I never will forget him. He's no longer amongst us, but uh, he's the one that gave me the confidence about being on that board. Now, whatever happened to uh, our other good friend who gave us a lecture, he and I became good friends at the end. And he learned to respect <laughs> the Duke graduate. Uh, he was a Carolina alum and uh, one of the old premier firms in North Carolina. So uh, that was another another chapter. It's a wonderful chapter, maybe for us to end on if there are no more questions. And let's use the, oh, there is, there is, back here. <laughs> Jerry McCoy from your class. Yes, sir. Let's <laughs> see. Uh, oh, I was, uh, I was at uh, graduate school at NYU, uh, and I'm going back and forth, I'd read the Times every day. And I read about uh, your run-in with the uh, dean, the, the dean's run-in with the North Carolina Bar on using this facility, which was at the time the only air-conditioned uh, law facility in the north state of North Carolina, for uh, thing. But he went to bat for you, didn't he? He did. Uh, when he when they withdrew their affiliation, uh, I'm sure that it thoroughly embarrassed uh, the bar. Although there were some who disagreed with him on the bar side. I, I was not even familiar with who on the faculty or who were the leaders in the North Carolina Bar Association. But I was happy and proud of the fact that Duke backed its graduate. And that, that made me uh, feel good. And uh, yeah, I, you know, we, we met when, 25 years ago at one other reception. And uh, we, we kind of coalesced that, and I gathered from the fellows that graduated when we did, uh, that that was a proud moment in their lives uh, and proud of the fact that Duke Law School uh, took, took a position. Uh, and I was extremely disappointed in this recent... Uh, uh, Allen Billen Escapade that no one from Duke would recognize the fact that you know Duke ain't all on one side. There are different aspects to Duke, one of which was the event in 1966 where they took a positive position. And somebody ought to say something about that, because all Duke ain't bad. Eric, I'm Gary Stein from the class of 56. I told you before your lecture that I got here in 1950 from Irvington, New Jersey, and Duke didn't seem like a very attractive place to me. I had no idea before I got here that it was segregated not only segregated in the university and in the graduate schools, but in the community. Nobody told me. But I thought you might be interested in my experience as an applicant to Duke, because it's a reflection of one of their historical, unfortunate uh, areas of discrimination that affected Jewish students. Uh, I went to Irvington High School. And Nobody in my family had ever gone to college, so I applied to Rutgers, which is a school in New Jersey. And there was a boy in my high school class who got accepted to Duke, and he said to me, why don't you apply to Duke? And I said, where's Duke? <laughs> and he told me. And I said, I, I can't afford a school like that. He said, no, no, take a look. Take a look in the catalog. 
tuition in 1950 is only $350 a year. I said, wow, that's not much more than Rutgers. So I went home and asked my mother and father if I could apply to Duke. They said, well, I don't know what Duke is, but go ahead. <laughs> so I applied. Rutgers had accepted me. And that kid who was going to Duke lived about three or four blocks away from me on a street that had one family houses. And uh, I never heard back from Duke one way or the other. And one day I was walking down that street and his father was sitting on the front porch. And he said to me, hey, Derek, are you going to go to Duke with Alan? I said, no, Mr. Max. He said, why not? I said, I don't know. I said, I applied, but I never, never heard back. He said, come into the house. So I went into the house. It turned out that Mr. Max had been on the boxing team in 1937 with a guy who was at that time the dean of undergraduate admissions. I don't need to mention his name, but they knew each other. He called him up with me there. Like you old son of a. He said, I got a kid here who goes to school with my Alan. He said, he's a hell of a lot smarter than my son. <laughs> <laughs> he never heard from you. The guy is, what's his name? I told him his name. And uh, they talked a little bit. He asked me to go out of the room, and I did. And I got accepted two days later. And he explained to me that there had been a quota for Jewish students, and the quota had been filled. So they didn't want to insult me by rejecting me. They just figured they'd just not respond. So that certainly was not the case at Duke Law School when I applied in 1990. It was a hospitable place for people of the Jewish faith, but not for African Americans. And from my perspective, Looking back from 2016, Duke has come a long way. It's a great story. It is, and I encourage everybody else to share and keep the conversation going. We've reached the end of our hour, though, so please join me in thanking Eric. For